Today's historic sentencing was filled with unforgettable moments from the powerful statements by the victims' families to the Crumbleys asking the judge for leniency. CBS News Detroit's Kelly Vaughn has more. Before the judge handed down her sentence, several family members of the students killed in the shooting delivered emotional victim impact statements. This tragedy has taken a, an incredible toll on our family. Hannah's murder has destroyed a large portion of my very soul. Some chose to address James and Jennifer Crumbly directly. It is devastating and heartbreaking that it doesn't appear that either of you cherished or even wanted your son. But I wholeheartedly wanted and cherished mine. While you were running away from your son and your responsibilities, I was forced to do the worst possible thing a parent could do. I was forced to say goodbye to my Madison. Others demanded the Crumblies take responsibility for ignoring the warning signs of the shooting. And the bulk of, of the responsibilities to address those signs lie on the parents, and they failed. Across the board, failed. It wasn't possible for Hannah to outrun the bullets spot by you, Jennifer Crumley, which were fired by the 9mm 6R that you, James, gifted to your son. Both used to murder Hannah, Justin, Tate, and Madison. In her address to the court, Jennifer Crumbly apologized for the pain that has been caused and asked for a fair sentence. I've been shredded by the public opinion me, shamed as a horrible parent, pain to be a terrible person. But the worst hell I carry is my own self-judgment, remorse, and deep regret. Her husband James also apologized, saying he didn't know his son was planning the shooting. If I could go back and do things differently, and maybe none of us would be here today. So again, I ask your honor to impose a just and fair sentence based on the truth. Judge Cheryl Matthews says she hopes their sentence of 10 to 15 years in prison will serve as a deterrent for future school shootings. Parents are not expected to be psychic, but these convictions are not about poor parenting. These convictions confirm repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train. You know, during her sentencing, the judge told the Crumblies that because of their actions or their lack of actions, we're missing out on the kindness, the talents, and the love that those four victims had to offer the world. Yeah, today marks, you know, the end of a chapter, a very painful chapter, but it'll never be closure or true justice for those families. Exactly right. right. Thank you, Kelly. Meanwhile, the Crumbly's son, the Oxford High School shooter, remains at the Thumb Correctional Facility in Lapeer. He is serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, plus 24 years. Attorney Ben Johnson, who represents the families of some of, some of the shooting victims, says while today marks the end of one painful chapter, their fight continues as they try to move forward with civil cases against the school district. Clients feel heard, they feel acknowledged, but of course, nothing will ever cure their hearts. And now it's up to Wolf, me and our, the other lawyers on behalf of these folks to do our job with the Michigan Court of Appeals, the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and explain why governmental immunity should be thrown out as unconstitutional, and this case should move forward in trial. And joining me tonight is Rick Convertino, a former federal prosecutor who has been with us just dissecting these trials uh, every step of the way. Rick, thanks for being here again tonight. Good evening. So 10 to 15 years from talking to you earlier, I know that wasn't a surprise to you, uh, but the state sentencing guidelines call for about seven years in prison. So can you explain to our viewers why Judge Matthews went so far and above and beyond those guidelines? Well, simply put, Shana, uh, Judge Matthews said that the uh, sentencing guidelines did not take into account the, all of the circumstances that were uh, that were adduced in this trial uh, regarding the evidence and uh, both the both the documentary evidence and the testimony. She said that uh, the severity of the circumstances, the the other victims, including the seven that were shot, um, notwithstanding the four who were murdered, uh, the defendant's lack of remorse, the unimaginable suffering that the defendants caused uh, both the uh, individual victims' families um, and the community at large, all were not included in the computation of the sentencing guidelines. And so therefore she determined that she could upwardly depart based on those factors and others. 
and, and reach the sentence of, of 10 to 15 years, which is a sentence that the prosecution requested in their in their sentencing memorandum. So 10 to 15 years, but they will be eligible for parole much sooner than that. Can you explain what will determine whether they are, are eligible or receive that? Well, they'll have parole reviews, uh, which take into account their, their conduct in while, while they're inside, the redeemability, whether or not they can be rehabilitated, whether or not they can enter the community as a, uh, a productive member of society. Uh, but I, I, I believe that they'll be serving you know, every day of their 10 years. And and tell us about the appeals process. What might that look like in the months to come? Well, right, uh, you saw today in the sentencing, at the end of the sentencing, both both uh, defendants signed their right of appeal and the request to appeal. Uh, they'll have to order the transcripts of the trial that each and every witness is um, uh, transcriptions. Uh, that, that'll be about $35,000 that the court adduced today. Uh, and if they can't afford that, then that'll be uh, the, a court appointed attorney will be provided to them and uh, one will pay for those all the fees and, and circumstances attended and what goes along with the appeal. The appeal process will take several months. It's a review of all of the witnesses, all the statements, all the legal issues, um, uh, the foibles in the trial, all of the, the contentions that the both sides, including and most importantly, the defense uh, wanted to raise. Uh, Maybe objections that that were overruled, or evidence that they wanted to admit that was uh, that was uh, withheld at trial. Um, one of the things I'm certain, beyond all peradventure, that'll be raised in appeal is the ineffective assistance of counsel, at least in Jennifer Crumbly's case. Uh, now, the best uh, position uh, to to present that to an appeals court would be an outsider, or another attorney, an appellate attorney, not the trial attorney. And I would anticipate that's that's certainly one of the one of the issues that'll be uh, uh, at least on her appeal. Uh, early on today, we heard a lot of back and forth about potential restrictions that uh, might be applied to the Crumbleys on whether they'll be able to contact each other while in prison uh, and even their son, the shooter. Uh, what can you tell us about that aspect? The Michigan Department of Corrections uh, has a general policy and procedure that that uh, co-defendants are, are not allowed to communicate once they're incarcerated, even in different facilities, and that's purposeful and, and, and intentional. Um, and so you heard uh, Prosecutor McDonald say that uh, they're not asking the court to to uh, treat these or have these two defendants treated in any other or unusual or different way than any other defendants or co-defendants. And so they're just asking the, the uh, court um, to, you know, to abide by the policies and procedures of the Michigan Department of Corrections and not allow co-defendants in a single case to to communicate, even though they're husband and wife in this case, which is which is unusual. Yeah. Speaking of unusual, before we let you go, Rick, uh, we've talked many times about how the specific facts of this case were unique. They were extraordinary in many regards. Uh, but a precedent has been set here. This was a historic case. Uh, what do you think that precedent is and what does this mean for other cases going forward? Uh, well, it's precedential in the fact that this is the first uh, mass shooting that is uh, that is four or more victims in, a, in, a, in an act of gun violence which is considered a mass shooting by the uh, U.S. Department of Justice guidelines. It's the first time that in a mass shooting, the parents of, of the uh, perpetrator, the murderer, are being charged. It's not the first time uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination that parents are charged or adults are charged for the uh, actions of, of, a, of, of one of their children. Um, in fact, in Michigan, it's happened uh, on more than one occasion where and people we had uh, that that's a Michigan case where father was charged with involuntary manslaughter when his daughter was able to get access to a shotgun that was unsecured and she shot her brother and killed her brother and the father was charged and convicted of involuntary manslaughter also happened in the city of Detroit where a mother uh, opened up a trunk to allow access to a weapon uh, by her son her son discharged it killed someone and the mother was there charged with involuntary manslaughter so the, the actions are not are not unprecedented uh, in this fact pattern. Uh, the only reason that it is in this case is because it's a mass shooting of four or more people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't anticipate that this will be, you know, that, that prosecutors all over the country will be jumping on the bandwagon if there's not the facts and circumstances to apply it uh, to their particular statutes in whatever state it is. Um, but it is unique because the, the, the facts in this case were ex exceptionally egregious. Um, the other thing that, that is uh, unusual about this case is 
uh, is the governmental immunity or the or the uh, qualif- uh, unqualified um, complete immunity that's that's applied to the school board and the school district in this case. And you heard uh, Ben Johnson, who's an excellent attorney. There's no backup in in Ben Johnson. He's a a, a hard charger, and I, I hope he can pierce the corporate veil in this case, so to speak, uh, because it's a tragedy. The school was certainly uh, a big part of of the problem in this case, and they could have and should have uh, intervened and stepped in, and and this could have been prevented on a number. As the judge said, there were multiple opportunities uh, where the slightest of, of uh, response could have prevented this. It's it's just a tragedy all around. Yeah, well, we will be following that appeals process with those civil cases very closely. Rick, thank you so much for all of your time throughout to all of these cases. Your insight has thank been you, so valuable. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. For complete coverage and analysis of today's sentencing, go to cbsdetroit.com.